Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the second most common element in the universe, helium. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to pick up. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Helium is the second element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is two because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. The first to discover the existence of helium was the French astronomer Jules Janssen. He recorded the helium spectral line during the total eclipse of 1868. At the same time, Norman Lockyer observed the eclipse from Britain. Lockyer was the first to propose that the line that he saw was due to a new element. If you put a diffraction grating over your camera during a total solar eclipse, you'll get the spectrum of the sun's outer atmosphere. There are three colors made by hydrogen, but there are a few more bright colors made by helium and magnesium, among others. By this spectroscopic method, helium was discovered on the sun before it was discovered on the earth. Lockyer named the element helium, after the sun god Helios, the god and personification of the sun. I want to expand a bit more on the method of spectroscopy. It's so important. You can identify elements by the unique set of colors their gases emit when excited. The color bars to the left of the element names show the color of light you would see with your eye. Break that light up with a diffraction grating or prism, and you'd see the light was really made up of a combination of colors. The top spectrum is glowing hydrogen gas. The one below it is helium gas. For comparison, you can also see neon and mercury. Every atom has a unique signature or spectrum. Look at the glowing element's light, and you can identify it. This method is called spectroscopy and is one of the most valuable tools in science, being used across almost all discipline. Where do these colors come from, and why are each atom's colors unique? This is a very simplistic model of the atom. The nucleus in the middle contains protons and neutrons, and the electrons surround the nucleus in shells. The energy levels of these shells are determined by the laws of quantum mechanics. Electrons can only be in these specific shells or energy levels. Like walking up a set of stairs. You can only stand on the stairs, not between them. Moving an electron from an inner shell to an outer shell requires you to put in energy. When electrons surrounding atoms are excited, they jump from a lower energy inner orbit to a higher energy outer orbit. The excitation energy can, can come from an electric current jostling the atoms, or it can come from incoming light energy being absorbed. Let's use electricity to excite this atom. Most of the time, the electrons immediately jump back, giving up the energy they gained as light. This is what you see in a neon sign or a fluorescent lamp. The bigger the difference in energy levels, the more energetic or bluer the light will be. Again, this is a highly simplified atom with only four energy levels. There are many, many more. But even here, you can see there are many possible jumps depending on how the atom is excited. Remember, each atom's energy levels are different. You may get a high energy ultraviolet jump, or a lower energy red jump, or anywhere in between. Atoms can each give off a whole variety of colors depending on the quantum mechanical arrangement of those energy jumps. 
a glowing tube of helium, gives off a whitish color light. When this light is broken into colors with a prism or diffraction grating, you see a variety of colors. It's that really bright yellow color that clued Janssen and Lockyer into the existence of a new element. Here we see the spectrum of the sun when it's not in eclipse. It should be in one long strip, but my screen isn't big enough, so the spectrum is broken into pieces and stacked up in this picture. The dark lines you see are caused by various elements in the sun's cooler outer atmosphere absorbing very specific colors, the same colors they would give off if hot and glowing. So by looking at these lines, we can tell what the sun is made of. Let me label a few of them. Sorry, the labels are so small. You can see lots of elements here. Unfortunately, the sun's outer layer, or chromosphere, is too cool to ionize helium appreciably, so helium lines don't really show up in this spectrum. It was thought for a long time that the sun was made of the same stuff as the Earth. That was proved wrong in 1925 by a brilliant astronomer named Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin. From spectra such as this one, she concluded that the sun was composed mainly of hydrogen and helium. But of course, because she was a woman, her results were ignored and rejected, only to be verified years later. She was eventually appointed to the chair of the Department of Astronomy and became the first woman to head a department at Harvard. If you look at the sun in the colors of light given off by specific atoms, you can learn lots about it. Here, we see the sun in visible light and in extreme ultraviolet light given off by helium. You can't see this ultraviolet light with your eyes, so here it's been colored red. Note the prominences on the edge of the sun, normally only visible during a total solar eclipse. This ultraviolet movie was collected by the Solar Dynamics Observatory, or SDO, spacecraft. This ultraviolet light can't make it to the surface of the Earth for observation because it's, thankfully, absorbed by the atmosphere. Helium was first spectroscopically detected on Earth by Italian physicist Luigi Palmieri in 1881. He was keen on analyzing the gases from eruptions of Mount Vesuvius, and he saw that really bright yellow emission line of the helium spectrum. The formal discovery of helium on the Earth was made in 1895 by chemists Sir William Ramsey, Nils Abraham Langlet, and Per Theodor Cleve, who found helium gas emanating from the uranium ore clevite. Here's the original bottle of clevite used for that discovery, and a nice sample of the mineral, which is actually a uranium oxide ore. As you've probably guessed, clevite was named after Per Theodor Cleve. What does a mineral have to do with the gas helium? It's all about radioactivity and how both uranium and thorium decay. There are three main possible ways a radioactive element decays. The nucleus can give off a gamma ray, which is just a high energy photon of light. It can emit a beta particle, which is a fast moving electron. Finally, it can give off an alpha particle, which is two protons and two neutrons. That's a helium nucleus. In our case, a heavy uranium or thorium atom both fairly common in the crust of the Earth, are unstable and spit out an alpha particle composed of two protons and two neutrons. This is a helium nucleus. The alpha particle can easily pick up a couple stray electrons and then becomes an atom of helium. Helium is extremely rare in the Earth's atmosphere, only 5.2 parts per million, not a big enough quantity to be commercially exploitable. But some of the helium produced by radioactive decay in the crust of the Earth becomes trapped there. 3,000 metric tons per year of helium is produced within the Earth. So 
Helium is actually mined from underground sources where the helium is trapped under non-porous rock layers, just like natural gas. Now, when I say mined, I don't mean by a group of burly miners with their helmets and headlamps, taking a plunging elevator into a mine shaft, digging all day, and finishing up in the evening with tanks of helium and high squeaky voices. Helium is a byproduct of drilling for natural gas. In 1903, geologist Erasmus Haworth collected a sample of gas from a well drilled in Dexter, Kansas. He found the gas contained 72% nitrogen, 15% methane, 1% hydrogen, and 12% of an unidentifiable gas. That gas turned out to be helium, which was previously thought to be very rare on the Earth. There's still a historical marker near the location of this discovery. We now purify that helium and store it 3,000 feet underground at the Clift Side Storage Facility near Amarillo, Texas. This is the United States Strategic Helium Reserve, which stores about 1 billion cubic meters of helium. Here's an aerial view of the facility. Helium is supplied to both governmental and private users by way of occasional helium auctions. Love to hear one of those. Helium is a non-renewable resource. Although it is being produced all the time by radioactive decay of uranium and thorium in the crust of the earth, we only have access to the gas from wells. As you can see in this chart, helium is under serious threat in the next 100 years. We should probably not be using it frivolously in helium balloons for birthday parties, but rather saving it for serious uses, such as in MRI machines and scientific research. The element helium is the second most common element in the universe, making up 23% of everything by mass, only surpassed by hydrogen. Given that the sun is made from the stuff of the universe, it's probably not surprising that helium also makes up 23% of the sun, also the second most abundant element there. Interestingly, it's not found in meteorites at all, but they are small, solid masses. Like meteorites, the crust of the Earth is rocky, but still contains a small amount because it's being generated there, only 5.5 parts per billion. The oceans absorb a tiny bit from the crust, but contains only a small amount, only 72 parts per trillion, exceedingly rare. And lastly, there is no helium in us, unless we're breathing it to do party tricks. It's an inert gas, and it plays no biological role. This complicated version of the periodic table shows the evolution of the elements through the history of the universe. Here, you see each element square with a tiny chart of its own, showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Helium is here. I understand this looks complicated, but I want you to notice that helium is one of three elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, that are primordial elements. Those elements have white backgrounds. They were created in the Big Bang. Let's look at just helium a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang until now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of helium created by various processes listed on the left-hand side of the slide. The majority of helium present today was created at the time of the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, and again is called a primordial element. For the first three minutes after the Big Bang, the universe was too hot to form protons or neutrons, so there were no elements at all. At three minutes, the universe had expanded and cooled enough to form mainly hydrogen and helium nuclei with a smattering of lithium, but was still too hot for electrons to stay associated with atoms. It would take another 370,000 years or so for the universe to cool enough for neutral atoms to form. In our helium square, this is represented by the white area. 
a small part has been distributed by supernovae, the yellow area, and some is redistributed by dying low mass stars, the magenta area. The latter processes don't get started until a bit later in the history of the universe. That's because they must exhaust their nuclear fuel first. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same, two protons for helium, but there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes. They're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are nine known isotopes of helium. And of these nine, there are two stable non-radioactive isotopes, helium-3 and helium-4. These two isotopes make up these percentages of naturally occurring helium in the universe, the vast majority being helium-4. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek, isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all these various forms of helium occupy the same place in the periodic table. All of the radioactive isotopes of helium are very short-lived. More on half-life in the next slide. I even hesitate to show you these. The longest lived is helium-6, with a half-life of only 806 milliseconds, less than one second. Some of the half-lives are measured in time units most people have never heard of. The ZS stands for zeptoseconds. A zeptosecond is a billionth of a trillionth of a second, 10 to the minus 21 seconds. And YS stands for yoctoseconds, a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, 10 to the minus 24th seconds. Light moving at 300,000 kilometers per second cannot travel across even a thousandth of the diameter of the helium atom in one half-life. I don't even know how would one would go about measuring such a short half-life. I suspect these are calculated. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slide, even the short half-lived ones. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. There are 12 elements that are gases at room temperature, including helium. This is assuming that Oganesson, OG, element 118, follows the same rules as the rest of its fellow elements above it in that right-hand column. They've only made a few atoms of oganesson, so we're not sure. Speaking of which, that right-hand column of the periodic table hosts what we call the noble or inert gases. These are the standoffish elements that really don't want to participate in chemical reactions. Why? Well, as we've discussed, electrons are arranged in shells. Each shell has a maximum number of electrons before you create a new shell. An atom with a full outer shell does not want to participate in chemical reactions. That outer shell can't accept another electron from some other atom to bond with it, nor does it want to give an electron to another atom to form a compound. The first and only shell of helium is complete when it's filled with only two electrons. The next shell is complete with eight electrons, and this is the element neon. Next is argon, then krypton with its eight electrons in the outer shell, 
Finally, we have xenon with its outer eight electrons. As a gas, helium is the second least dense element at 0.1786 grams per liter of gas at zero degrees Celsius. Only hydrogen is less dense. Most of the time we give densities in grams per cubic centimeter, but for gases we'll use grams per liter. In its liquid state, at minus 269 degrees Celsius, it's 700 times as dense at 125 grams per liter. Remember that water has a density of 1,000 grams per liter, or in more common terms, one gram per cubic centimeter. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When I do this talk with an actual audience, I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself, but we'll have to wait to do this until we're face to face. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, and magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, helium's density as a gas is 0 0.1786 grams per liter, or on this chart, 0 0.0001786 grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle, slightly above hydrogen, which is about half as dense. Helium boils or liquefies at minus 268.928 degrees Celsius or minus 452.07 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the lowest boiling point of any element. Helium does not freeze into a solid at normal atmospheric pressure. To freeze it, you have to apply a pressure of 25 atmospheres. By the way, Helium was first liquefied in 1908 by Heike Kammerling Onis. He also discovered superconductivity in 1911. He received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1913. Liquid helium boils at really low temperatures. We usually encounter temperatures between zero and some tens or a couple hundred degrees on either the Celsius, or if you live in the US, the Fahrenheit scale. Water freezes at zero Celsius, or 32 Fahrenheit, and boils at 100 Celsius, or 212 Fahrenheit. There's another scale that physicists use that makes a little more sense. It has no negative temperatures. It's called the Kelvin scale. Moving to the bottom of this temperature scale, zero is called absolute zero because you can't take any energy from atoms or molecules at this point and make them cooler. Absolute zero is minus 273 degrees Celsius or minus 452.07 degrees Fahrenheit. Helium boils at 4.222 Kelvin or minus 268.0 928 degrees Celsius, or minus 452 degrees Fahrenheit, just a few degrees above absolute zero. If you cool liquid helium to a temperature at or below 2.172 Kelvin, the liquid undergoes a strange transition to something that's called a superfluid. Superfluid helium loses all viscosity and flows with zero friction. This leads to some strange behavior, like you see here. Liquid helium creeps up the inside of the glass bowl and down the outside, finally dripping off the bottom. This will continue until the bowl is empty. Weird. Superfluidity was discovered in 1937 by Piotr Kapitsa, John Allen, and Don Meisner. Kapitsa received the 1978 Nobel Prize for his work in low temperature physics. If we compare the size of the helium atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The hydrogen atom is almost 1.7 times the size of helium. I don't often get to say that hydrogen is the larger of two elements. Helium is only 31 picometers in diameter, and a picometer is only one trillionth of a meter. Atoms are really small. 
Here are atom sizes sorted from largest, cesium on the top left, to smallest, helium on the bottom right. Helium has the smallest size atom of all the elements. If we rearrange the previous chart, we get another interesting look at atom sizes. In this graph, like the previous one, the vertical axis is the size of the atom, and the horizontal axis is the atomic number of the atom, the number of protons in the nucleus, starting with 1 for hydrogen and going up to 86 for radon. With hydrogen on the left, we see patterns. The alkali metals, the yellow labeled elements found in the leftmost column of the periodic table, all have large sized atoms because they all have only one loosely held electron in their outer shell. The magenta labeled noble gases in the right column of the periodic table have very tightly held full outer electron shells. These are the smallest atoms in their respective periodic table row. Again, notice helium with the smallest atom I've relabeled in blue. Helium's small atomic size makes it hard to keep around. A normal rubber balloon is too porous and the helium will leak out, making the balloon less and less buoyant over time. Thanks to Little Shop of Physics for taking the time to do this. Helium is a relatively inexpensive element. It goes for about $24 per kilogram. However, this is for the common helium-4 isotope only. Isotopically pure helium-3 is another matter completely. Let's look at that. We'll start our comparison with a relatively inexpensive gas, hydrogen with its almost $1.40 per kilogram. Remember that helium is 17 times as expensive, off this chart as a matter of fact. To add the next element to our comparison, gallium, we have to multiply the range of our chart by 100 times. This changes the size of the hydrogen bar by a factor of 100 as well. On this chart, gallium is $148 per kilogram. Still not outrageous, but for comparison, let me add helium-4 at $24 per kilogram to this slide only. Osmium is a rare metal, and we have to change our chart range by a factor of 100 again. You can no longer see hydrogen, and gallium almost disappears. Osmium is pretty expensive at $12,000 per kilogram. Now we're getting into some really expensive stuff when we add rhodium. We have to multiply our chart range again by a factor of 10. Hydrogen and gallium have disappeared. Osmium becomes one-tenth the size, and we can now see that rhodium is a mere $147,000 per kilogram. We've finally arrived at comparing helium-3. We have to yet again change our scale factor by a factor of 10, and this reduces the osmium and rhodium bars. But we can now see that helium costs $1.4 million per kilogram. Pretty impressive for a kilogram of gas. Believe it or not, even at this price, helium-3 has its applications. So let's take a look at a few applications of helium. Helium has many uses that fall into broad categories. The biggest use is in cryogenics, making things very, very cold. 32% of helium is used for this. 18% is used for pressurizing and purging other gases. Another 18% is used for controlled atmospheres. 13% for welding. 4% for leak detection, since helium with its small atom is so good at escaping almost any containment, and 2% for breathing mixtures. All other applications account for the remaining 13%. Let's look at a few of these. Part of the other category is the first thing people think about when they think helium, its use in keeping balloons floating. This is, of course, because helium is less dense than the air around it. 
air at room temperature has a density of around 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter, more than seven times the density of helium at 0.166 kilograms per cubic meter. Like a low-density cork floating in higher-density water, the low-density helium balloon also floats or is buoyant on the higher-density air. It might be worth noting here that because of its low density and high molecular speed at normal temperatures, helium gas molecules bumble their way to the top of the atmosphere and eventually escape into outer space. Before helium was discovered, the first hydrogen-filled balloon was invented by Jacques Charles in 1783. Around the time helium was discovered, but way before you could obtain large quantities at reasonable prices, German Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin promoted the idea of rigid airships lifted by hydrogen that were later called, wait for it, Zeppelins. They had their first maiden flight in 1900. Regularly scheduled flights started in 1910. While hydrogen gas has the best lifting power due to its low, low density, it does have its drawbacks. On May 6, 1937, a hydrogen zeppelin, the Hindenburg, caught fire as it was attempting to attach to a mooring mass in New Jersey. It's starting to rain again. It's, the rain had uh, cracked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It burst into flames. Get it started. Get it started. It's flying and it's rising. It's rising terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast. And all the folks between us, this is terrible. This is the worst of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's just it's, it's, it's like 20... Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is rising to the ground, not quite to the morning. Nowadays, we no longer use flammable hydrogen and have opted for the chemically inert and non flammable helium to lift our balloons and airships. In many instances, when you are welding two pieces of metal, you don't want the hot metal reacting with oxygen in the air. TIG welding is the answer. TIG stands for tungsten inert gas. In TIG welding, the electric arc from a tungsten electrode melts the metals you're joining. The electric arc and melted metal are kept inside a flow of inert shielding gas, sometimes argon and sometimes helium. The inert gas keeps the oxygen in the air away from the melted metal for enough time for it to cool. This is useful for welding stainless steel, aluminum, magnesium, and copper alloys. TIG welding is also called heliarch welding when helium is used. The giant magnets in an MRI machine are superconducting. This allows very high currents to flow, which produce extremely high magnetic fields necessary for the MRI imaging technique. Superconducting magnets must be chilled to extremely low liquid helium temperatures. The MRI scans you see on the right are of my head, from the top and from the side. Beneath the covers of the machine, the helium-chilled magnets and coils of the MRI machine spin around you at very high speeds, which is what makes much of the noise when you have this procedure. I, for one, am glad the covers hide this frightening spectacle from me. It looks like a time machine or a giant meat grinder. A normal MRI sees the differences in hydrogen and hence water content of the body. This means it's not good at imaging air-filled lungs. Breathing a bit of helium-3 helps. Helium-3 can be detected with an MRI and therefore aids in bringing contrast to something that is otherwise invisible to this imaging method. Of course, helium-3 is expensive too, so this is probably restricted to research for now. Note the difference between A, a healthy volunteer, B, someone with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, C, asthma, and D, serious cystic fibrosis. 
Since helium liquefies at temperatures way below hydrogen and oxygen, helium gas is pumped into the space above the liquid hydrogen and oxygen in the rocket fuel tanks, forcing that fuel into the combustion chamber below. Here, you see the launch of Apollo 11, a hydrogen-oxygen powered rocket, delivering the astronauts to the first landing on the moon in 1969. Moving from astronauts to aquanauts, deep sea divers often use an oxygen helium rather than an oxygen nitrogen breathing mixture. This is because at the higher pressures underwater, nitrogen dissolves in the blood. When the pressure is released as the diver ascends, this dissolved gas can bubble out in the blood, causing a painful or even fatal condition called the bends. Also, at higher pressures, nitrogen can have a narcotic effect called nitrogen narcosis, also known as depth intoxication or rapture of the deep, which can seriously and dangerously impair a diver's physical and mental abilities. Helium does not dissolve in the blood, so these problems are not an issue. But, of course, helium is more expensive than free atmospheric nitrogen. That rare and expensive isotope of helium, helium-3, may prove a useful fuel for future fusion reactors. Here, we take two helium-3 nuclei and combine them into a helium-4 nucleus, resulting in a release of a good amount of energy along with a couple of protons, or hydrogen nuclei. Because this process produces no neutrons, the reactor does not become radioactive by neutron bombardment. Free neutrons can cause many elements to change into radioactive isotopes. There are none in this reaction. Where are we going to get the helium-3 for this method of fusion? Just about all the helium-3 produced today is by the decay of tritium, a radioactive isotope of hydrogen. Tritium is a byproduct of our nuclear reactors. Tritium decays by beta particle admission. One of the two neutrons in the nucleus becomes a proton and spits out an electron, conserving charge. This beta particle carries away energy. In addition, there's a mysterious and hard to detect neutrino emitted. What's left behind is a helium-3 nucleus. There's another proposed method. Some of the solar wind from the sun is composed of helium-3 and is deposited on the moon's surface over time. Still, it's pretty rare. It's believed that between 1.4 and 15 parts per billion of sunlit lunar surface is helium-3. On Earth, it's about 1 1,000th that. It may be possible to extract this helium-3, though it's estimated you'd have to process 150 tons of lunar surface material to get only one gram of helium-3. We can improve on that a bit. Some of the craters near the lunar south pole are in permanent shadow, and the concentration of helium-3 there may be slightly higher by about maybe uh, three times. Those are labeled here in blue. Of course, to make any of this work, we first have to make nuclear fusion work. And that's been about 20 years away for the last 50 years, and still is. So put a pin in that. We'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about helium. Begin universe. Wait three minutes to enter. Stay cool. Don't react. In the next program in this series, we'll examine the first of the alkali metals, lithium. I hope you'll join me. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about helium.